The Principles of Jesus by Robert E. Speer Published 1902 The Principles of Jesus Introduction People are no longer content with the conventional judgments about conduct that satisfied them a few years ago. It is a striking sight to see them turning instinctively to Jesus for light on their difficulties or to claim his authority in support of their solutions of the problems of life. There is something touching, says Harnack, in the anxiety which everyone shows to rediscover himself with his own point of view and his own circle of interest in this Jesus Christ, or at least to get a share in him. It is the perennial repetition of the spectacle which was seen in the Gnostic movement even as early as the second century, and which takes the form of a struggle on the part of every conceivable tendency of thought for the possession of Jesus Christ. There is a striking testimony here to the abiding authority of Jesus. He would approve of our course, those say who are sure. What would he do if he were here, others ask who are in doubt? Jesus Christ is the revelation of right in life. Whatever he approves is right. Whatever he condemns is wrong. But what would he approve if he were here today, and what would he condemn? It is possible to err in neither of two ways in answering this question. One, some attempt to apply with rigid literalness the exact saying of Christ to present conditions. Sell all that you have! Lay not up treasure on the earth. Give to him that asketh of thee. Lend. These sayings and others are treated as legal prescriptions to be mechanically obeyed. But this view is impossible and unchristlike. It is impossible. None of its advocates sells all that he has. Tolstoy does not. It is unchristlike. Jesus did not come to establish a new legislation in place of the Mosaic Code. He came to displace legalism by the spirit of a true life, to supplant prescription by principle. He refused to tell all things to his disciples as a pure legalist would have done, or to issue minute instructions concerning their conduct. The spirit will come, he said. He will guide you. Two, on the other side, men err in so refining away the teaching of Jesus in ethical sublimates that nothing solid and stable is left. Jesus established no organization, they say. He laid no hard constraints upon men. He broke up the enslavements of the past, whether of opinion or of ritual. He lives now not as the teacher of a doctrine or the founder of an institution, but as an influence, an inspiration an evidence of what we may be if we will be brave enough to be free. But Jesus was not just this. He came to give men power to live a new and eternal life, it is true. But the new life was to be the eternal life lived in time before entering upon eternity. And he revealed in himself the objective standards and principles of the eternal life thus abiding in time. Following in Jesus' steps accordingly is not wearing the sort of clothes which he wore, neither is it merely the possession of a sweet feeling toward all men irrespective of the moral life. It is the application to conduct today under its changed conditions of the principles which found expression in the life and teaching of Jesus 1900 years ago, but which, because they are principles, are not local, transient, and personal, but universal and abiding. The purpose of these studies will be to seek in the life of Christ for some of those principles which should guide our lives. These principles found one application in his life. He lived in his own age and country, and he fitted himself to his time and the people among whom he moved. We live in another age, and the methods and problems of our life are different. But the same principles which guided him are to guide us. He washed his disciples' feet, for example, and told them, Ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now that teaches us not that we should preserve the ancient custom of foot washing, but that the principle of humility and service should rule us now as it ruled him then. The true way to answer the question, What would Jesus do now in my place? 
is to study the principles of Jesus' life and teaching. Only so shall we be able intelligently to strive to do whatever he would like to have us do. And we could not undertake any Bible study more fundamental and necessary than this. Nor could any be sweeter or more helpful. For all Bible study is valuable just in proportion as it shows us the face of Jesus. That study is most directly helpful, which leads us to look straight at him, whom Luther called the proper man, who was the revelation of the Father's will for every man. What Jesus was, the Father would have each of us be. What Jesus did, the Father would have each of us do. These studies are presented in this form for the use of individual Christians in their own study of the Gospels and their own guidance of their lives, and also for groups or classes which desire to examine the applications of Christ's teaching and example to the conditions of our present life. It would be helpful if ministers and other teachers in their midweek prayer meetings or on Sunday evenings would take up such a course of study as is suggested here and strive to lead their people to bridge the chasm that has too often separated our lives from our ideals, our deeds from our dreams. At any rate, we need to be recalled, as these studies attempt to recall us again and again, from the shifting opinions of men to the solid judgments of Jesus, from their uncertainty to his authority. To whom else shall we go? He has the words of eternal life.